This vodcast will be covering batteries and half reactions. We're going to take what we've learned about redox reactions and actually apply it to something useful. So let's review really quickly. I'm going to try to, try to do this in less than 15 minutes. Let's review what we know already about redox. We know that redox is the process of someone is losing electrons or getting oxidized, and someone is gaining electrons and getting reduced. We have that cute little Leo says Gur to help us remember that. Now, while that's all very well and good, what we're going to look at today is how we can tap into that to do something useful. So what we're going to be looking at today is a battery, and specifically how redox works to make, it's called a galvanic cell battery. You'll also hear this sometimes called a voltaic cell. I use those terms interchangeably, so be prepared for either of those. We're going to be talking about the same thing, galvanic cell or a voltaic cell. Now if you think about what redox is, someone is losing electrons and someone is gaining electrons. If we can kind of get in the middle of that electron flow, we can have some electricity. If you remember, all electricity is, is the flow of electrons. So let's see how we can do that. What I have down here is a picture of this kind of image right here in the middle is a galvanic cell battery. And what I want to do is break down for you what's happening um, on both sides. Normally, when we think about a redox reaction, the demos that we saw in class, all the chemicals are kind of mixed together. But what we've done here is we've split the redox reaction in half so that the oxidation takes place on the left hand of the battery and the reduction takes place on the right hand side. I'm going to start with two metals that make up a common battery these days. I'm going to start with um, zinc metal on the left and copper metal on the right. You're going to learn later, or maybe you already figured out, um, depending on the order that you did these activities in, why I chose those two and how I knew which way the electrons would flow. If you don't know that yet, sit tight and you'll figure that out eventually. So let's take a look and just kind of talk through what we have here. I have two beakers and in each one is a strip of metal. Here's the strip. And each one is sitting in a solution of itself. So you can see like these dots here represent, if this is zinc metal, those dots represent dissolved, represent dissolved zinc. And same thing over here, if that strip is copper metal, these little circles here represent dissolved copper, aqueous copper. So zinc is going to be the one that is getting oxidized. So let's take a moment to write that down. If zinc is getting oxidized, copper is going to be getting reduced. So let's look at just the chemistry that's happening on the oxidized side. You have zinc, metal, going to, it's getting, remember, oxidized, Leo, losing electrons is oxidation. So zinc will be losing electrons, which will make it more positive, right, because electrons are negative. So Zn is becoming zinc 2 plus. On the other side of the battery, the opposite half is happening. So we're going to have copper, a cation, getting reduced, remember, gaining electrons to become a copper metal. The other thing I want to emphasize with this is that when we're talking about something with a charge, we're talking about it in an aqueous solution. So we're going to add those AQs over here. When we're talking about something without a charge, that's going to be referencing things that are solid. So on the left-hand side, we have solid zinc becoming aqueous zinc cation, and on the right-hand side, we have aqueous copper cations becoming solid copper. Okay, so let's focus back now on the oxidized half. What happens is that whenever zinc gets oxidized, it's going to be losing electrons. Now, those electrons want to go somewhere, and if we can give those electrons some place to go, we can get very useful things done, like um, lighting a light bulb or powering a cell phone or something like that. When we hook up um, an electric wire, to that piece of metal. What that does is we've provided now a pathway. That zinc, you can think of zinc as um, an electron pitcher. It likes to pitch electrons. It wants to get rid of them. It really likes to be oxidized for reasons you will learn later. Um, so 
think of that as an electron pitcher. It really wants to get rid of those electrons. Copper, on the other hand, is really good at gaining electrons. So what we can do is we can help out these two chemicals. We put the pitcher and hook it up to the good electron catcher. And so what happens is that electrons will flow on whatever pathway we give them. And in this case, we're going to give them a pathway that has them flow through a light bulb so we can get useful things done, like making light. The electrons will flow on this provided pathway from the thing that's getting oxidized to the thing that's getting reduced. Now, when that happens, we've made electricity. But that's not all that's going on in here. What's happening is as this process is going on, the chemicals in the batteries halves are reacting together too. So notice I referred to these as the halves of the battery. You'll hear these referred to sometimes as half reactions or half cells when I'm focusing on what's happening in one half of my battery. So I would say the zinc half cell is getting oxidized and the copper half cell is getting reduced. I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening over in the oxidized half. Take a look at, let's kind of refocus in on this equation. I told you that when we're talking about something with no charge, we're talking about a solid. When we're talking about something with a charge, we're talking about an aqueous battery or an aqueous solution. So over time, we want to think about what's going to happen to the appearance of this piece of metal. So this battery is running and running and running. The electrons are flowing. And this reaction happens over and over again. Solid zinc gets rid of the, some electrons and becomes aqueous zinc. More solid zinc gives away electrons and becomes aqueous zinc. Over time, the appearance of this strip is going to start to look kind of eaten away. It's going to start to look smaller. And the reason that that's happening is because the zinc metal, it's not disappearing. You can't see me now, but I'm making air quotes with my fingers. It looks like the zinc is disappearing. There are those air quotes. But what's happening is that it's going from a solid state to an aqueous state. It's becoming dissolved, so we can't see it anymore. The zinc is still there, but it's going from solid to aqueous and solid to aqueous. So over time, the appearance is going to start to look like the piece of metal, the electrode, is starting to shrink over time. That's what's going to happen on the oxidized side. Go over now to the reduction half cell where the copper is. The opposite process is happening over here. So what's going to happen is we have these aqueous copper ions. They're going to be absorbing electrons from the wire, right? Because electrons are flowing into that half of the battery. They're going to be absorbing those electrons and becoming solid copper. So over time, what's going to happen is that that copper metal is going to start to look kind of fuzzy. It's going to start to look bigger. It's growing. And the reason that is, again, it's not you know, bringing those new copper atoms from nothing, what it's doing is it's taking those copper atoms that are in solution, tacking electrons onto them, which forces them to go into their solid state. So what I'd like you to do next is um, pause the vodcast and in your own words, answer this question down here. I say, why do batteries die? I just told you the story up here about what happens to the appearance of this zinc metal over time, and then what happens to the appearance of that copper metal over time. So in your own words, answer the question, why do batteries die? And then come on back to the vodcast when you're done. OK, I'm sure your answer was brilliant. If not, you can ask me <laughs> about it later, and we can come up with an answer together. There's a couple of more vocabulary and terms that I need to introduce you to. If you remember, um, I re once referred to this piece of metal as an electrode, but we also have two vocabulary words that we need to stick on this battery somewhere. And those words are cathode and anode. Depending on how much you know about batteries, you might have heard those words before. Cathode and anode. What I'm going to show you next is a little sentence that we're going to write down that will talk you through how to figure out which half of the battery is referred to as the cathode and which one is referred 
referred to as the anode. Going with the animal theme of Leo the lion says grr, this one, it's slightly violent, but just stick with me. Write it down exactly as I write it down. The term is an ox sat on a red cat. Hidden in here somewhere are the terms that will help us figure out which half of the battery gets oxidized and which half gets reduced. I'm color coordinating for you, so maybe help you visualize that. Okay, an ox. What this part tells us over here is that the anode of the battery is oxidized. The blue tells us that the cathode is reduced. So the anode is oxidized and the cathode is reduced. Let's go back up to our picture and label those. So we would refer to the zinc side, the losing electron side. This is the anode part of our battery. And that makes the copper the cathode. You'll always have one of each. Someone will be gaining electrons and someone will be losing electrons. So they'll always have one half as the anode, one half as the cathode. Okay, one, there's one last piece, oh sorry, two last pieces. Um, if you've ever looked at a battery, think about um, a battery that you've seen. Have you ever noticed how they have a plus end and a minus end? The reason that that is, is it kind of comes back to these terms here. If you remember back to first semester, we learned some terms that start with an and cat, specifically having to do with positive and negative things. If you in your brain said anion and cation, A plus. Um, if you remember, anions are negative, so the anode part of the battery we label with the minus sign. If you remember, cations are positive, so we label the cathode with the plus sign. Now you might be thinking, well, a couple of people always ask this, and this is a great question. Miss PB, why is it um, if the electrons are moving this way, why do we give this one the negative. Aren't the electrons leaving the anode? And the answer is yes, they are. Why is the cathode positive? Because aren't electrons coming towards it and electrons are negative? Yes, they are. But think about this as kind of um, at the start of the battery, we give these labels of positive and minus. So um, you can think about it like the electrons start in the anode. So the anode is going to start out kind of more negative in a sense. Not really, but that's kind of how we're going to think about it. So the electrons start in the anode, so the anode's negative. They'll flow to the cathode, and um, the cathode will start out as positive but become less so as the battery runs. There's one piece of this battery we have not talked about yet, and that is this little thing in the middle right here, the salt bridge. Um, some people incorrectly think that the salt bridge completes the circuit. It does that in part, but what it does more importantly is it balances charges, and I'll talk about that here in a second. When you're going to work with your salt bridge, it's going to be potassium nitrate. Now those are going to be in aqueous solution, so they're going to be labeled as being bonded together, but it's going to be dissolved in water, so they're both going to be kind of floating around independently. The reason that the salt bridge balances the charges is this. Think about those electrons flowing in the battery. Our battery's running and running and running and the electrons are flowing into the cathode. Eventually what's going to happen because those electrons are negative, the cathode is going to start to get a buildup of negative charge eventually because all those electrons are going over there. That's going to get a negative buildup. What the salt bridge does is it helps kind of cancel that out. If that negative charge built up so much and we just let it build up and build up and build up, eventually, stick with me, the cathode would become so negative it would start to repel electrons because if you remember, a like charges repel. So if we just let it run and run and run, eventually what would happen is it would repel electrons, which is bad. We don't want that to happen. So what happens is we'll add the positive ions from the salt bridge will travel down into the cathode and neutralize and kind of cancel out some of those negative charges. The same thing happens with the NO3. The NO3 is going to go over here 
And because over here, the anode will be getting more and more positive and positive and positive as the cathode gets negative and negative and negative, the nitrate will kind of travel over there and help balance out the building positive charge over in the anode. So that's what I mean when I say the salt bridge balances charges. OK, with that, we are all done clocking in at just about 15 minutes. The last thing that I want you to do, if you're still having trouble visualizing this, there's another link in Schoology called Galvanic Cell Animation. And it just kind of helps visualize this. You get to see this in action more rather than just trying to um, listen to me talk about it. So with that, that is batteries and half reactions.